Oh, well. Hi. Hey, guys. If you're new and you haven't joined us for the last 17 weeks, my name is Nate. And I'm Angela. And we had a weird experience this week. What so, was our weird experience? Well, we were just getting ready for this lesson that we wanted to teach. We've been every Sunday um, at 1 o'clock p.m. Mountain Time. We put together just a lesson about marriage and relationships. And um, I was listening to this podcast by Brene Brown. Uh, and oh, who was the the co-host? Harriet the, Learner. Learner, Harriet Learner, Harriet Learner, who's an amazing psychologist, and she's written a book about forgiveness and how to forgive and why we forgive. And um, so I was listening to this podcast, thinking, or like, was man, it apologize, apologize. You're right. Why we apologize? Uh huh. Why Thank we you. apologize? I appreciate that welcome. correction. Uh huh. And I was like, wow, this would make a really great lesson. And then Angeline came in and goes, "What should we talk about this week?" And I'm like, "I don't know. What do you want to talk about?" And she goes, "I think we should talk about apologies." And I was like. <laughs> Do you want to hear what I'm listening to right now? And so it just felt like it was a really great topic to cover. And um, we learned so much. Not, not only did we learn so much, but it reaffirmed so much of like right. how important this topic is. Honestly, we were really lucky to be introduced to this topic when we were engaged. So we, when we were engaged, we listened to Celebrating Partnership by Alison Armstrong. Yeah, really and good. Sh this was the first time that I had heard this concept of just how important apologies are in our relationships. Right. We hear so much about forgiveness and all these things, but just the two simple words of I'm sorry have so much importance in the quality of our relationships, not I, just in our marriages, but in our... I actually want to push back on that. Okay, go ahead. Push back. Because that's what we're taught that an apology is, is the words, I'm sorry. Right. But like, do you right. remember I watch, I watch like little kids and their parents, like out on the playground, a kid pushes another kid down and it's like, okay, go tell them you're sorry. And that's mm -hmm. what the apology is. But when you're an adult in a relationship, if you have the same strategy that you learned when you were like five years old to apologize to your partner, we'll get into, into more detail here. Um, it's not going to be effective and it actually might do more harm than good. And so what we want to talk about today is why it is important to know how to apologize and how to apologize well. Right. And what that looks like. So we'd love it if you would stick with us through this entire, I don't know, couple of minutes that we're going to be, we'll probably go for about 40, 45 minutes. Um, I do want to call out the fact that I am wearing a jacket. Why? <laughs> because you were wearing, you came in wearing a dress and I was in shorts and a t-shirt. I'm wearing and I'm a like, dress now because I can't fit anything else on my belly. I just felt very <laughs> underdressed. So um, just a heads up, we can see your comments. So if you want to comment on uh, Facebook or YouTube, if you're streaming and you have any questions about like what's going on, or you just want to say hi, we can see those and we'd love to hear from you. And as quick housekeeping, we may or may not be here next week. Yeah. Angeline might be having a baby we are that close to the due date so if we don't make it next week um to lesson number 18 that is why you ready yeah what's it say so when an apology is done right it's healing when it's done wrong or not at all it can be very detrimental so this is why we apologize number one we apologize because it can be very healing in a relationship yeah and apologizing can increase your intimacy. It can increase your connection. It heals those rifts that are created when we do hurt each other because inevitably we will. Can I do a quick brain science thing? Yes. So brain, the researchers have shown that when you get hurt physically and when you get hurt emotionally, many of the same areas of your brain light up. And so getting kicked in the shins can be very similar to having a promise broken mm -hmm. or having a partner use the wrong tone, tone of voice. And that's why they say like their heart hurts. Yeah. Like it really does. Like it hurts. So when something goes wrong in your relationship, like the, the reaction that you have to an emotional pain is often very similar to the reaction you have to a physical pain. We've talked about this before, but I think it's worth recapping really quick. And what happens when you are exposed to a threat, whether it's a, uh, somebody who's got a knife or somebody who punches you in the face or a ball flying at you or some, you touch a hot stove, your instinct is to flinch, to pull away from the thing that hurts you. And we do the same thing emotionally in our relationships. When your partner says something with the wrong tone of voice or they're dismissing or they're cruel and um, unkind to you, the instinct that you have is the same as if a ball were flying at your face, you pull away from the thing that's causing you harm. And if you don't know how to apologize, you don't ever learn how to heal 
the pain that you inflict on your partner. And what mm -hmm. happens is you keep flinching farther and farther away from each other until you wake up one morning and you're like, my partner's so far away, I don't even know who they are anymore. So um, it is important to learn how to apologize because it is healing when it's done right. And if you don't do it right, it's going to cause more damage. Or if you don't do it at all. Or if you don't do it at all, even worse. Yeah. And honestly, in our culture, we aren't really modeled <clears throat> how to apologize very well. Um, and apologies can feel uncomfortable. It feels like we're giving up a sense of power. Um, I know I struggled saying I'm sorry as a teenager for a long time, just being, just admitting that I had, wasn't the person that I always thought I was or that I had that capacity to hurt somebody um, was really hard. And so I avoided it a lot. And so yeah. I think that that's why we avoid apologies sometimes. Totally. So what can apologies do? Let's talk about the three gifts of apology. And this is something that we stole from that podcast with yes, Brene Brown, we but we want to recap it, it for so you. <laughs> it is linked in the description if you want to go back and listen to it and go into more detail. But we thought this was like a really great way to start off the conversation is talking about what you get out of it if you actually have the courage to go apologize the right way. And these are just really simple, really simple gifts. The first gift is it's a gift to the person we hurt. How is it a gift to the person that hurt? Well, I think for the, in the first place, um, sometimes when we get hurt, you know, we get really angry at our partner and what we really want is we want to feel like we're not insane. Right. You're not a crazy person for being hurt. You know, am I crazy for thinking that you used a condescending tone of voice just now? Like there's, there's a part of you that just really seeks it. You're the person that I love more than anybody in the entire world. Thanks. And those moments where I feel like you don't get me, you don't understand me, make me wonder if I'm nuts. And they make me feel really scared that if you don't get me, nobody else will. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we get hurt sometimes, especially when it's by the person that we love most in the world and we don't get a sense of validation or understanding of the experience that we're going through, it makes us start to want question whether or not the relationship is solid, whether or not our sanity is truly there. Um, uh, you start to feel unsafe, I think. Well, and this also contributes to escalation of arguments. Yeah. I feel like when, when I've been hurt and I feel like I'm not being understood or I feel like you can't see my perspective, that's when the tone of voice starts to change when the volume of the voice yeah. starts to increase when I get it's resentful just, when it's just like I just want you to see things the way I see them yeah and if that doesn't happen I get really resentful right. and then that then the conflicts start to build on each other so when you apologize to the person you've hurt it's amazing how just simply validating their reality can calm the situation immensely yeah. it can calm them it can soothe them it can make the anger and the resentment just melt away um, simply by acknowledging Doctor, that they're, they're hurting. Dr. John Gottman talks about conflict a lot because that's his shtick. Like he talks about marriage. And one of the things he says that I loved is, love is that the purpose of conflict is not to resolve the conflict. The purpose of a conflict is to seek mutual understanding. And that includes a sense of validation and recreating safety for the person that you're in relationship with. Mm -hmm. So um, that is a massive, massive gift that is a part of an apology that we'll get into a little bit later. But I want, we want to go over the other two gifts that you get out of an apology um, when you do it the right way. The second one's a little counterintuitive, but apologizing to someone you hurt is all actually a gift to yourself. It promotes greater self-respect. It allows you to see yourself more objectively and it shines a light maybe on some weaknesses that you have that you haven't realized that you have. Um, and it helps it growth long-term when you, when you practice apologizing to other people. And How, what do you mean by that? Well, how does it promote growth? We all have a view of ourselves that we hope to portray to the world. And a lot of times um, when we hurt somebody or when we are informed that we have hurt somebody, it brings this view that we have of ourselves into question. And that can be really uncomfortable and it can put up our defenses, defensiveness. It can make us angry. 
But when we're able to genuinely apologize when we've done something wrong, um, it helps us to, again, shine a light on those weaknesses so that we can work on them. So that we can be like, oh, I didn't realize that I came across as a bully to people. I, I that would... just happened. <laughs> Talk about Should that. Should we tell that story really quick? Yeah. So I just, I just had a really interesting experience this last week. So um, somebody jumped into the Facebook group on for my high school graduating class and left a post that basically said, hey, uh, let's all come clean to each other. Who is somebody, tag in the comments, somebody that bullied you or somebody that you had a crush on? And um, of course, like the comments started filling up with all of like the past high school crushes that was really funny. Mm -hmm. But then somebody jumped in and tagged me and said, hey, uh, I remember Nate being kind of a bully. He, I remember trying to talk to him once and he gave me a funny look and just kind of dismissed me. And then I was like, oh, like that, I never really saw myself as a bully. I didn't ever, I, I, and I, when I think back in high school, I think of myself as kind of the nerdy guy who got picked on more often than not, not the guy who was the bully. Um, and so I jumped on and I was like, hey man, I've grown up hopefully. Mm -hmm since then. And I just want to apologize. Like if I did anything that hurt you, I am more than happy to have a conversation with you and resolve things. And I hope that there's some space there for some growth and change. And I, I thought it was like, okay, I, I, I dealt with this. Okay. And then like 10 minutes later, somebody else jumped on and said, yeah, I thought you were kind of, you hated me. Like I thought you were kind of a jerk. And then somebody else jumped on and said, yeah, you hated me too. Like you, you were mean to me. And I was like, oh my gosh. And this thread of like hundreds of comments of people talking about their crushes, I was the only one who got named as a bully. And it shattered this idea of who I saw myself as, as a high school student. Um, it was so out of alignment with my, my remembrance and my recollection of my past. And it made me have to confront like this part of myself that I know, I know deep down, I have a part of me that's like disagreeable and that might hold grudges and might be like, I, I think one of the qualities that I grew up with, that was instilled in me in part by being a member of the church that we belong to is I was very judgmental. Like mm -hmm. I, I looked down on other people who didn't live their life to the same set of standards or morals that I did. And I did not do a very good job at disguising those judgments. And so there were a lot of, there were a lot of times through high school where I think I came across as very judgmental and standoffish and mean and said, I said and did some cruel things that I regret. And um, having to come face to face with that in a public setting on social media, where it will probably live on forever, <laughs> was uh, was a, a little bit of public shame. <laughs> I mean, it, it wasn't a huge deal, but it was like a moment of it was a moment where I got an opportunity to face something that I didn't like about myself, and I got to choose whether or not I leaned into it and could grow from it, or I, if I let it destroy my week and it became something that I could ruminate on. So another way this is a gift to yourself is that it allows you to kind of get outside of your comfort zone a little bit. Growth doesn't happen inside your comfort zone. We say this all the time yep. and it can be really uncomfortable because number one, a lot of times when you apologize to someone, it can feel like you're handing them ammo that they can use against yep. you later. It can feel like you're, you're giving away power. It can feel, um, really scary and vulnerable. Yep. But in the end, or you, you can be revealing something about yourself that you don't really like. And then that can be like, they could just exploit that and be like, you're right. You are a jerk. You right. are a, a mean person. You are cruel. You are selfish. And then they can give you more examples of that, that kind of back up the thing that you're admitting and trying to make right. And that can be a scary thing. Or there's a fear that they're not going to accept your apology. Also true. So, but in the end, um, it is a gift to yourself. So it's a gift to others. It's a gift to yourself. And then lastly, again, these are so simple. It's a gift to your relationship. Like we said before, when you apologize, you heal those rifts, you come closer together, you increase your intimacy, you increase your vulnerability with each other. And um, honestly, this is something that we've been trying to practice. Again, I mentioned that we were introduced to this concept when we were engaged we've been trying really hard to practice this over the last four years of marriage. And it's, it gives you a clean slate so often. Like when, when someone asks us about past arguments or things that we argue about, I have a hard time remembering them. We patch stuff up really quick. Right. 
Um, it's a skill that we've acquired. When you heal a wound faster, it's less likely to scar. It's less likely to get infected. It's le less likely to leave marks. And the process that we use is what we're going to talk to you about, like throughout the rest of right. this show. So really well. if you're watching and you're curious about, like, how do I heal my heal my partner? How do I get my partner to apologize? How do I do a better job of apologizing? Keep watching because that's what we're going to talk about right now. Right. But when when you clean those slates, they don't leave as big of a mark and you just don't remember them. And so when we do have arguments, we're not bringing stuff up that happened six months ago oh, or a year ago yeah. or two years ago. And um, it's I a really lot love easier that about to, you, that you don't thanks. punish me for past mistakes. Well, it's this whole concept of yeah. apologizing. Anyways. Well, um, and then I think one last thing to hit on before we dive into how we apologize is this, is that there there's a right way and a wrong way to apologize. And if you do this the wrong way, it can do more damage than good. And there's a very real possibility that you've been doing it the wrong way your entire life because most people aren't taught how to do this. Right. We're just not. The, the the apology framework that we use throughout our life is the apology framework that we were taught as children. And that's, right. you say, I'm sorry, and then you move on. Well, just an example of this. Um of the negative consequences of omitting an apology or not, or not saying an apology, right? I had a situation a while ago where a friend had said something that just really hurt my feelings. It, it was not intentional. They didn't do it on purpose. It was not something that they knew would offend me. And I didn't say anything in the moment and went home and just like sobbed my eyes out. Mm -hmm. And it was just really, really hard for me. And they ended up Find, I mean, I probably should have gone to them and told them that it hurt me, but they ended up finding out how badly it hurt me. And the response was, I have nothing to apologize for because I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't, I didn't know it would hurt her. So I'm not going to say sorry. And that hurt almost worse than um, the actual offense. Right. And it's one of those things where as much as I, appreciate the relationship it's probably not going to be the same yeah i probably won't ever share anything super vulnerable or you know get super open because that relationship in a way has been damaged there's topics and areas of conversation that you will not ever venture into with that person right. until that trust is restored right and so this is an important thing to point out before we dive in as we as we dive into how to apologize is that um you don't this is something that we say all the time in our marriage. You don't apologize because you're wrong. You don't apologize because you made a mistake. You don't apologize because you're guilty of something. You apologize because your partner is healing or your partner is hurting and you have the tools necessary to heal them. Right. Angela is a nurse. If she walked into a patient's room and they were in extreme pain and they were suffering and they said, please, please, I'm in so much pain. I need help. And she had a medication that could help solve their problem or um, or kind of like numb their pain. And it was acceptable for them to have that. She would be in trouble. It would go like against the Hippocratic Oath if you don't if you don't do your part to help ease the suffering, their suffering. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. And this is, I think it's important to realize this because it's amazing to me how many people will sit next to the person that they, that they love more than anybody else in the entire world. And their partner can be suffering in, in great pain. And they have the tools to ease that pain, to heal their partner. And they go, well, I didn't do it on it's purpose. It's not my fault. I didn't do it on purpose. So I don't I need don't to say it. I'm sorry. I don't see it the same way. Yeah. Uh, and to me, it's just ludicrous. So think about an apology as instead of an admission of guilt, it's an opportunity to heal your partner's pain. And when you do that, it's amazing how much more willing you are to go through the process we're about to teach you to actually heal their pain and make them feel better and reconnect you to your partner and, and create a healthier relationship. Right. So how we apologize. And a lot of this we we've taken from different resources. We've taken it from Allison Armstrong and Celebrating Partnership. There's things from this podcast we linked to, but these are the four steps that we've used in our relationship that have really helped when it comes to needing to apologize. So the first one is to listen. And this one is probably one of the most important steps. It is the most important step. I am guilty of when Nate comes to me and tells me something that 
that I have done that's maybe hurt him or that he would appreciate an apology for, I immediately start coming up with my, my defense. I, I stop listening to what he's saying and I immediately start, you know, creating this, this response to prove that it's not what he thinks it is. And when you do that, you, you don't truly put yourself into your partner's shoes and see where they're coming from. So this is a really important step that you listen to understand and you listen to get into their shoes and see their perspective. Yeah. A lot of times it's, you did not mean at all what they're saying. A lot of times they're completely misrepresenting what was going on in your, in your mind or what you meant by it. But it's important to really understand where they're coming from. And this also includes maybe asking questions like, tell me more or help me understand. Yeah. That's all part of this listen step. Yep. Um, remember the goal of conflict is not to solve the conflict. It's to create mutual understanding. So I mm -hmm. want to give you a couple tips on how to listen. One thing to do, and this is something that I learned this week, Dr. Gottman does when he listens to his wife, Julie, Dr. Julie Gottman, like he is, they, they are like the relation, the world's greatest relationship experts, arguably. Mm -hmm. And they still do this, but he uses a pen and paper. He gets, a, he has a notepad that when his wife is upset and wants to talk about something, he takes notes. And doing that helps him stay out of reactive mode and defense mode. It kind of puts you in a journalism frame of mind where you're kind of like writing down, you're doing, conducting an interview instead of um, being, sometimes I think when you're listening to your partner and they're upset about something, it's easy to feel attacked and get defensive and that shuts the whole conversation down. So one way to keep, keep from doing that is to um, take that notepad and paper and take notes on what your partner is saying so you can stay focused on and stay present on what's coming out of their mouth. Essentially, whatever you need to do to um, stay focused on what's coming out of their mouth. Yep. It was something that's not going to set your partner off even more. I feel like if you pulled out a notepad and paper, I might be like... If I told you what it was for, though. Right. It's true. Um, the other thing that's really important is that you don't just listen about what they're complaining about or what they're upset about, but you need to listen to the emotion behind the thing. Mm -hmm. So if if your partner, what's something that you've been upset with me about? Um, maybe I'm like watching TV while she's cleaning the house and, she, and she's really angry that I'm not pulling my weight is what she's upset with. She's like, I'm in here cleaning the kitchen, mopping the floors, vacuuming, and you're just sitting there watching an NBA game. Like this is I'm ridiculous. Feeling unappreciated. Feeling unappreciated. Yeah. So it's interesting. Like it's easy to get focused on, well, let me tell you what I do for you. Mm -hmm. Like you might be doing this right now, but look at all the things that I've done for you that, that balance things out. And then it turns into an argument. But if you can listen for the emotion behind the thing that you're talking about, and this is what we're talking about when we say, listen, uh, oh, Angela feels unappreciated. She feels like un unvalued. Maybe she's feeling a little bit lonely as she's doing the chores today. Maybe she's really stressed out. And I can hear that. I can speak to that emotion instead of speaking to the problem. And when the emotion goes away, amazingly, the problem goes away. So if mm -hmm. I respond to her like, get off your butt and come help me. I'm sick of cleaning the house by myself. I can say, hey, I it sounds like you're really, you're frustrated about something. What's going on? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh, I just had this really hard conversation with a friend and and work has been really stressful this week. And now I just feel like I'm just cleaning the house all by myself and and I'm just exhausted. And I'm like, oh, great. Well, why don't you go take a nap and I will take care. And, and then it's easier to find a solution. And the emotion underneath that's causing the problem gets treated instead of just the problem itself. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so there's a lot to this listen. It's not just listening to the words that are coming out of their mouth, right. but reading between the lines as well. And I think the second part of listening is the is this is a huge, huge part. This is really big with apologizing. And this is huge, especially for people who don't like to admit that they're wrong. Yes. Um, and there's a difference between validating your partner's experience and admitting that you are wrong. Right. So a great example. Angeline is very sensitive to tone. Is that fair to say? Yes, I am very sensitive. If I use the wrong tone, it really rubs her the wrong way and she can really bristle and get upset. And that can be the, that's the source of many of our arguments in our marriage. And um, one of the things I've had to learn to do is to validate her experience without making it about me. This goes back to um, this being a gift to the person that you're hurt. Absolutely. That you hurt. Sometimes when... Um, you get in arguments like that. You don't feel safe. 
but when someone can validate that you're not crazy, I think the words that come out of your mouth that I really appreciate is I can totally see yeah. how it came across that way. Even if you didn't mean it that way at all, just simply saying, I can totally see where you're coming from. I can totally see why you would think that I was being irritated with you. Right. I could totally see how you could, you would think, or you would experience that as me being impatient mm -hmm. or condescending, which is something you really hate. Right. Um, another, another good part of this validation phase is, is repeating back what you've heard. Word for word. Just saying, if I hear you correctly, you're telling me that when I forgot to take out the trash, um, you were really annoyed by that. Or what I hear you saying is um, when you use that tone with me, it you felt disrespected. Um, by the way, if you have already learned something about how you could be better at apologizing, will you just let us know in the comments or hit, hit the little like button so we know that you're out there? <laughs> So that we know that this is actually beneficial to you. Um, but but if you apologize without validating your partner, um, your partner's still going to think that they're crazy. And this is the difference between saying, I'm sorry, let's move on. And I'm sorry, I get what, and I, and what I understand saying. what you're, what you're experiencing. Right. And at the end of the day, what we want when we like, when you fall in love, the thing that you really want and the thing that it brings you closer to your partner than anybody else you've ever been close to is the feeling of feeling gotten. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. The feeling that your partner gets you better than anybody else in the world. And if you have an argument and then you have 10 arguments and then you have a hundred arguments and your partner never validates you, you start to question whether or not you're gettable, whether or not anybody could ever understand your experience. And, and literally I've talked to people who question their sanity. Mm -hmm. They think that they're going nuts. Because they're like, am I am I crazy for wanting to my my husband or my wife to like see things from my point of view? Even if their realities don't match up, even if you don't think that what they're saying um, correlates with your worldview, I love the story that Allison Armstrong shared yeah, about this. Sure. She said that there was one day she was on big, she was on a business trip and she got to the car um, rental area and there were two different cars that she could choose from. And so she called her husband and she said, Jeff or whatever his name is. I can't remember what his name is. I have the choice between the, this car and this car, which one, which one should I choose? And he said, well, I think you should choose this car because this and this and this and this. And she was like, oh, okay, actually I think I'm going to get the other one. And then she hung up and got the other one. And what she called her husband for was validation, but what she got was an opinion. But when she called him later that evening, he was really kind of bristly with her and he wasn't very nice to her. And she was like, what's going on? And he started saying, well, you disrespected me. And she was like, I disrespected you. What do you mean I disrespected you? And he was like, you asked me for my opinion. I gave it to you. And then you just like blatantly ignored what I said to you and ended up going with the other thing. And in this situation, she didn't mean to disrespect him. She didn't feel like she disrespected him in that way. She, she didn't do it to slight him. But from his worldview, from his perspective, she had disrespected him. And so in this situation, she was able to validate him and say, yeah, I did do that. I did choose the other car when you when you yeah, formed like, an opinion and told me otherwise. I, I asked you for your opinion under the guise of I trust your opinion and I trust you to keep me safe and help me make the right choice. And then I at, literally right after you gave me your thoughts your and that you had thought through everything, I discarded it and went with what I wanted anyway. Knee jerk reaction is to be like, I did not disrespect you. I didn't res disrespect you. Right. That's I just ridiculous. The car. It's like quit overreacting. But her approach was, you're right. Mm. I did do that. I can totally see where you're coming from. Again, that, that response just makes a world of difference. Yeah. And they were able to fix it and move on. It wasn't her saying. Brittany says she loves it. Oh, thanks, Brittany. Um, she also says, I love the idea of writing down our feelings and thoughts while the other person is expressing their feelings. It will definitely, if you're the type of person who gets emotionally flooded or emotionally overwhelmed easily, that is definitely a tip that can help you stay grounded. Right. Um, and then Quincy says... 
taking responsibility is a huge one for me. Just saying, I recognize that I made a poor choice and it really hurt you and I really want to do better. Like Quincy, that's huge. That's, that's super mature. It's a super mature approach to take. And it's also a really hard approach to a take. Yeah. And it's a perfect segue into the third step that we're going to talk about, which is taking ownership. Yep. Um, From whatever it is that you can possibly take ownership of, even if you feel like 95% of it is just completely erroneous. If there's 5% of it that you can be like, yeah, I did do that. Right. Do it. Take take ownership of what you did. And this happens during our tone conversations mm-hmm. a lot. It's like, look, I'm not trying to be condescending right now. I'm just stressed out. And that's just the way my voice sounds when it's stressed. And I can totally see how you w- could experience that as me being condescending or me mm-hmm. being impatient with you. And I'm sorry. Like, I did speak that way. I yeah. did take that tone. I did use, You're right. I did use a tone that could totally be interpreted that way. And just, it wasn't directed because it wasn't a result of you and your choices. Mm-hmm. Um, so taking ownership is really important. Find whatever it is you can that you can take ownership of. And this takes a little bit of humility. Yep. Sometimes it, it takes admitting that you're maybe not as great as you thought you were. <laughs> Which is like, that is the gift of relationships. Right. You know, we talk over and over about how a relationship is the, uh, the ultimate human growth machine. And the only way that you grow, like the NBA finals are going on right now. I enjoy watching a handful. I don't watch a lot, but I watch the occasional uh, like jazz game and people who play at that elite level, like the elite of the elites, the reason that they're so good. I mean, they obviously have natural talent and gifts, but they also have a coaching staff Mm -hmm. and their coaching staff is constantly running them through drills and finding areas where they as a team are weak and they as individuals are weak and making them run drills and and um, and practice so that they can strengthen those weaknesses. And ultimately, the winner of the championship every year is typically the most cohesive team. The people who have focused on strengthening their weaknesses the best and have all all of the missing pieces taken care of. They've they've fixed their missing pieces. And that's what marriage is for a human being. Is it's it basically like you have a coach. You have somebody who. Um, whether intentionally or unintentionally exploits your areas of weakness and gives you the opportunity to either own it and practice and get better or close your eyes, be ignorant to it, and then continue to fail over and over until it does so much damage to your relationship that even if you stay together, you don't have much of a relationship. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Another part of this take ownership that I think is really important, um, Harriet Lerner says to... Eliminate the word but after an apology. Yes. So an apology that says, um, you're right. I said a really hurtful thing back there and I'm sorry, but you were being a big jerk. <laughs> like that just cancels Squash. out your apology. Yeah. That just makes the apology void. Or you're right. I did get home late, but... Blah, 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 my blah, boss blah. called a meeting in the last minute. Right. Like or... it just it just cheapens your apology and it doesn't feel like an apology to the person. If you hadn't started it, I wouldn't have said that in the first place. Right. Like any anything that excuses the behavior or the thing that you did that hurt them, like or turns it back on you and makes it your fault. Yeah, not <laughs> an apology. So right. make sure that you're avoiding or or um I'm sorry you feel that way. Yes. That's not an apology. So an enough- apology is an apology requires you taking ownership of the circumstances that were created that caused somebody pain. It's not about you turning the ownership back on them. Right. And the the way to do this when you're taking ownership is to focus on your actions and not to focus on their response or their emotions. So this is, this is one that's really hard for me. (laughs) I say a lot of times, um, I'm sorry you feel that way. And that's not an apology. It's the worst. I hate it when you say that. I'm sorry you feel that way. Yeah. It's basically well, saying. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way. Like, yeah. I, I don't really care. You know? Sorry you're so sensitive. I'm sorry you're so sensitive. Um, Yeah. Or or saying their emotions. I'm sorry. Quincy said, she says, um, it's just that yep. all the time. Yep. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I said that. It's just that if you hadn't. Right. Yeah. It's just that every single time you do this. Um, Another thing. That would be an example of this is when you say, um, I'm sorry that um, you were offended by the joke that I said. I'm sorry That's their offended. emotion. You're saying I'm sorry yeah. for, the, for them being offended. 
but what you need to do is focus on your action and just say, I'm sorry that I told that offensive joke. They use that example in the podcast. It's mm-hmm. worth listening to. Um, there, I guess there's a guy in a board meeting and he's, he made a very sexist joke and then afterwards approached uh, a Dr. Lerner and said, um, hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you were offended by that joke that I made. And she's like, that's not an apology because it doesn't take responsibility well, for your like, actions. I am not, her response I'm not that, was, easily, I'm not offended. that easily offended. But it's, she was still not, she didn't feel good afterwards. She still felt that angst, that, that kind of frustration. But if he had said, Hey, I'm sorry for the joke. I said it was, it was like inappropriate was for the setting or it was inappropriate in general. And that's it. And left it right there and didn't try to like make it about her reaction to his joke. And he just took responsibility for his part. That is this a takes a huge amount of practice. Yeah. I will be the first to admit that I struggle with this. I struggle with this very much. We all do. Yep. The, anyway, I'm looking at comments. Sorry, Sorry. we're getting distracted. <laughs> uh, Bernice, Bernice says, I really just like the word but, mm-hmm. and I hear it quite often. Um, Suzette says, I feel like saying, but in so many conversations just causes you to blame, shame, or justify your behavior, which doesn't sit well with most of us. Right. hundred percent. Exactly. Well said. Exactly. Uh, last step. Yep. Last step is make restitution. So great example. Um, like let's say I, let's say I take Angeline's car out and I go run a whole bunch of errands and then bring it back with an empty tank of gas. And then she runs out of gas on the way to work and gets really frustrated. Um, That sucks. Mm -hmm. So what can I do to apologize? Well, I can listen to her. I can validate her experience. I can apologize, take ownership for not having filled up her gas tank. Then I can go pick her up. I can get her to work. I can go fill up her gas tank. So she doesn't have that problem tomorrow. And then next time you take the car out, make sure that I'm refilling. Sure so restitution has to, has to do with like, if you damage something or ruin something, fixing it. And it also has to do with committing to do better in the future and then living up to that commitment. It's the action behind the words, right? Because you can, you can say the perfect apology. You can make someone feel so good about the situation. But then if you either repeat the action, if there's no change in behavior, there's no change. Um, it, it would almost have been better not to have the apology in the first place. Yeah. But so that's really important. So those are the four steps to a great apology. It's not just I'm sorry and move on. It's listen, validate, take ownership, take responsibility for what you can, and then make a restitution. Right. Now, there's a couple of caveats that we want to throw in here that will instantly ruin an apology um, or or make the things worse that we want to talk about before we sign off. The first one is over-apologizing. This is, I think, mo- you can tell me if I'm wrong here, but I think it's most common with women. There's a tendency, um, I think it's definitely common with women. Tendency to apo- over apologize, and I think there's two ways that people over apologize, right? Yes. Is that what they said in the one, show? One that they say in the in the show is you just say the words "I'm sorry" constantly, like when you bump into someone, "Oh, I'm sorry," or um, show up two minutes late. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. You talk over somebody. I'm sorry. Uh huh. Yeah. Just just saying the words "I'm sorry," "I'm sorry," "I'm sorry," "I'm sorry," "I'm sorry" all the time. This is something I struggled with for a long time. Um, and so when you actually do say the words, I'm sorry, when you mean them, they don't, they don't carry any value. They don't carry any value. Cause it's just kind of like a word that's just, um, that people are used to hearing from your vocabulary and it doesn't, it doesn't carry the same weight. And so one thing that I tried to do to prevent myself from saying, I'm sorry so much is I tried to, um, Replace it? Replace it with thank you. So if I was five minutes late, instead of saying, oh, I'm so sorry I'm five minutes late, it would be like, thank you for waiting for me. Thanks for being patient. Thanks for being patient with me. Um, You know. Instead of I'm sorry I took the last piece of pizza, it's like, hey, thanks for letting me have hey. the last piece of or pizza. Or if you bump into someone saying, oh, excuse me, or pardon me, instead of I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, the other, that's, that's one way to help. The other way that you can over-apologize is, um, and this is something that I've seen that is very, it's a painful experience. And uh, if you've had this happen to you, just like type me in the comments. Um, But like, have you ever had your feelings hurt by somebody? And then you go try and address it with them. And their response is like, so over the top, and they're so emotional, and they're so 
they feel so they feel so bad and so devastated by what they did to you that they become an emotional wreck and then you have to soothe and take care of them and you were the one who was hurt in the first place and now because of their over the top apology and the grief that they feel and their inability to contain and regulate their own emotions you are now in charge of of handling the fallout of the person that should be making the apology right does that make sense Right. So if you if you can't contain your own emotions, if you can't um, regulate yourself, and when you hurt somebody, it's so hard for you to bear that you lose that you lose it. You just like fall to pieces. That's actually it's not. I think it's easy to conf- to think that it's a good thing to feel that bad about the mistakes that you make, but really it's putting an extra burden right. on the person that you've hurt to now manage your emotions on top of their own. I've. I've been guilty of this um, <clears throat> in our relationship. I don't really want to hurt Nate. I don't want to. And I've had situations where he's come and said something that I've done. And then, and then I just think, oh my gosh, I'm a horrible wife. Oh no, I can't believe I did this to you. And um, just beat myself up and beat myself up. And then Nate's like, come on, it's not that big of a deal. Don't beat yourself up. And it just like completely takes away from the situation. It's can, it can be really, right. It can be really vulnerable to come to someone and say, Hey, this is how you hurt me. And it does no good for them to have to be like, they might be afraid in the future to let you know that you've hurt them because of the way that you reacted. And, and then that, um, just keeps them from letting you know when you've, they've been hurt and then it just creates um, more of a festering issue. So. Yep. And then the other thing here that could ruin an apology is sitting around and waiting for the other person to initiate. I loved what Harriet said. She said a recipe for failure in a relationship is waiting for the other person to either change or apologize. So an apology is not about who's to blame. It's not about who started it. It's about being the first person to go and say you're sorry. We, I, who, somebody told me this really early on. Um, they call it rushing to the altar. It might have been Wes and Tara Wages, Tara, Tara Wages. I don't remember, but uh, I think it was when I was doing my cross country interview. Somebody told us that they have a culture in their relationship that they, they try to be the first person to the altar, basically symbolizing the first person to go sacrifice themselves and say, hey, I'm back. I, I admit my mistake here. I admit my failure, my shortcoming. And I think that's a beautiful concept of right. like, even if, even if your other partner instigated the issue, and even though you, they might be responsible for 97% of the pain and the frustration that was caused, you being able to step in and say, you're sorry for your 3% is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And the other thing that's really hard about this is not expecting an apology in return. Yeah. An apology is not <clears throat> something you do to get your partner to do something for you. Yeah. Um, the other thing, um, some people apologize as a way to heal themselves from the guilt that they feel for doing something wrong. Yeah. Like they'll go to someone and say, I'm so sorry I did this, expecting them to be like, oh, well, this goes into our next, our next one. Expecting them to be like, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I get it. Or to say, you know what? I'm sorry too. But we just can't expect that when we give an apology. Again, it cheapens the apology. Yeah. That's not the purpose of the apology. Yep. And so the the last tip that can ruin an apology is is stop saying it's okay if somebody hurt you. Because it's not. Like it's not okay, especially when there was some sort of intentional harm or something that was really cruel that was done. Uh, I would just encourage you, kind of like Angeline started saying thank you instead of I'm sorry, <clears throat> when somebody apologizes to you, outlaw the words it's okay in your house. Mm-hmm. You just don't say it's okay. You say thank you for the apology. For that the means apology. a lot. Or thank you for the apology. That really did hurt. That doesn't and, give you an excuse to be like, thank you for the apology. You really should think about this next time before you do it. <laughs> no, you don't rub their nose in it. Right. But you can just appreciate the fact that they said, I'm sorry. Like, receive it. Mm-hmm. Don't dismiss it. Right. Um, that will help them be more um, quick to apologize in the future. Yeah. And um, yeah. Okay. We've got a question. Okay. 
Bernice says, what if someone does something wrong to you and they say they're sorry, but they keep doing it over and over and over again? That makes me cry so much. It really hurts, especially when the person is someone that I love so much. Or, yeah. What do you think? Um, that's a great question. Or that's a great question. I think it's something that we've all dealt with at some point or another is having somebody in our life who- A repeat offender. Hurts us over and over, but never changes their behavior. And um, at some point, so- <sighs> This is a boundary conversation. It is a boundary conversation. We've done some episodes on boundaries that I would encourage you to go back and listen to. But um, I'm reading a book right now called In Intimacy and Desire by David Schnarch. And he talks, I'm going to try and summarize a very complex idea <clears throat> really quickly here. But he talks about how um, initially when you fall in love with somebody, what you, what most of us fall in love with is how the other person makes us feel. You know, we get a sense of validation from them. We get a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning. They make us feel good about ourselves by the way that they talk to us and treat us. And they feel that we get all these really positive vibes from the person that we're with. And what he essentially what that is, is it's a borrowed sense of self-esteem. We get our sense of worth and sense of self-esteem by how somebody else treats, treats us or speaks to us. Now, that's a a really great thing. It feels really good. And it's basically from the time you're a child, that's the way that you are. That's the way you live your life. Like ch children don't have self-awareness to create their own self-esteem, their own self-worth. It, oh, it's always borrowed. And so when you come into a relationship, like it's just what you know. And one of the ways that marriage forces us to grow is that eventually that borrowed self-esteem that we get from the way that somebody else treats us, it's it. two things happen. One, is that as a partner, it becomes exhausting to continuously prop up your partner and have to be the source of their validation and the source of their self-esteem and the source of their feeling good. And that if I'm in a bad mood or if I don't say or do the right thing, it causes my partner to fall to pieces. And um, on the flip side, uh, there's a sense of um, being reliant on somebody for your self-esteem can also be really hard because if they are in a bad mood and they can't give you what you want or they get tired of giving you what you want, you feel like hung out to right. dry. <clears throat> it's like, well, what do I do now? I got all of this happiness and joy from you in the past. Now what do I do? And what marriage forces you to do is figure out how to stand on your own two feet or basically create your own sense of self-worth and self-esteem. You have to learn to calm yourself down and not rely on your partner to call you, calm you down when you're feeling um, out of sorts. You have to rely on yourself to be proud of yourself and, and, and find the things that you're doing good in life and in your relationships and pat yourself on the back rather than getting that validation from your partner all the time. And um, it's a difficult process to go through to, to get a sense of like earned self-esteem instead of being propped up, borrowed self-esteem from your partner. And <clears throat> part of that, that process is um, learning that when you have an argument or disagreement or somebody hurts you, it's your job to stand up for yourself. It's your job to stand up to your partner from time to time. Like one of the hardest things about love is that in order for your marriage to be successful and your relationship to be successful, it requires you sometimes to put your relationship on the line. It requires you to say, hey, the way things are going right now, if they continue to go this way, I don't see a future. Because if you have that borrowed functioning, if you have that borrowed sense of self-esteem, that can be a terrifying thing. Because if your relationship ends, so does your worth. So does your self-esteem. So does everything else. This is a really hard idea to paraphrase. But right. as it's, you it's as you hard... as you learn to like stand up for yourself and say, hey, you're breaking promises. Hey, you're not following through. Hey, you're doing things that are hurtful and you set clear boundaries with clear consequences. And maybe one of those consequences is the future of our relationship doesn't look bright. If we can, if you continue to treat me in this way, it, that is a thing that helps you create a sense of um, earned self-esteem. It's your own, it's your own sense of self-worth. It's not borrowed anymore. And you know that if your relationship, you're, you're basically reaffirming to yourself that if your relationship, heaven forbid, does end, you're going to be okay and that it's not on you. And if if you can't respect yourself in your relationship, you can't expect your partner to, re to respect you. And so um, when you start treating yourself with self-respect 
and you start standing up for yourself and you start creating consequences for inappropriate behaviors, it's going to be really uncomfortable for your partner. It's going to be really uncomfortable for you at first, but that's, that's the only way to really deal with a situation like that is to move away from that sense of like, this will only, my life will only be purposeful and meaningful if my partner is always there to validate me and make me feel good. And then in turn, that makes you willing to tolerate behaviors that are not appropriate. Again, we've done podcasts about boundaries and we did a marriage prep class about boundaries. So again, this is a really hard thing to just sum up in a few minutes. So go check out those episodes about on boundaries from the podcast and then from, yeah. um, our past lesson. Sam said, um, I love how all this is very personal and impro about personal improvement. I know that it's the basis of what you guys do. I just appreciate that even, even more, no matter what we are, no matter what we are in control of ourselves and show the example and, and the side note, just hoping that our partner or our spouse will do the same. And Sam, I guarantee you that as you take more responsibility for yourself and you control what's within your control, it puts pressure on your partner to do the same. They can't escape for very long. Um, and people will try to escape that personal responsibility because it is uncomfortable, but the more you do it, the more that they're going to embrace, be forced to embrace it themselves or make choice, make the hard choices, which would be to, to leave the relationship because they just can't tolerate mm -hmm. their own growth. And Bernie says that a lot of times she was the one that asked the question. A lot of times it's with her, with siblings yeah. and not necessarily spouse. Like it doesn't necessarily have to be your spouse. That's the repeating offender. It can yeah. be a neighbor, people. a friend, a sibling. I... I have a question about apologies that I think some people might have as well that I want to address. Yeah. So what if, again, you're going into apology, not expecting an apology in return and not expecting your partner to give you anything in return. What if it's a situation where you genuinely felt hurt by something that they did um, and they don't see that they hurt you? but you're the first one going to apologize and initiate the conversation. This is something that they addressed in the podcast. Yeah. And what they said was you can bring it up. Just not in that moment, right. leave the apology a sacred. So if you show up and you apologize and you're expecting them to go, you're like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I hurt your feelings. I can totally see how that happened. Let me be responsible for this. And you make restitution. And then you're like, and they're like, thanks. And it's like, and you kind of you, you kind of want to go. Anything you want to say to me? I also was hurt by this, so don't do that in the moment. <laughs> it's absolutely appropriate to revisit that down the road, but in the moment, just let your apology be an apology. Let it breathe, and then come back maybe a day or two later, or a couple hours later, or when it's appropriate, and bring it up again. But don't right. turn the apology <clears throat> into a uh, bait and switch, where the only reason that you're apologizing is so you can get. The apology from the other person in that mm -hmm. moment right yeah anyway that is our recipe for apologies they are important the, and honestly please check out the podcast with Brene Brown because they talk about it so eloquently and in a way that that gives it more context and more meaning and it's two episodes long an hour each and we've only listened to the first half and it's just really really good so and she's got a whole <clears throat> two books on it so i link to it in so, the description of the video there's so much to this subject and we just barely brush the surface but apologies are so important and this is a skill that you have to master if you want to have the relationship that i know you want if right. you re if you refuse to master this skill you are leaving something on the table you're settling inside your marriage there's this is like a massive opportunity for growth for most of us because I think all of us were taught to say, I'm sorry and move on. And it just doesn't cut it. And my guess is if you're experiencing some distance, some disconnect in your relationship, it's probably because you have years and years or even decades of emotional hurts that have built up over time and they've never been repaired. They've never been healed. And if you can, you can literally go back and use this process to heal all those little hurts and reunite you and bring you back together. And so that is the hope of what uh, you can accomplish after learning stuff here. Right. So um, <clears throat> that's our lesson for today. And we'll hang out for a few minutes if you guys have any <clears throat> questions about apologies or about anything in general. Sam says, love the baby bump. Thanks. We are in the final countdown. We are. A couple days away. Yeah. So we might not be here next week. <laughs> Thank you for digging the suit. The only reason I put this jacket on is because Angela showed up wearing a dress and I was wearing a t-shirt and I was like, mm. 
<laughs> Nate is underdressed. <laughs> anyway, thanks for joining us today, everybody. We are going to go nourish and strengthen our bodies and do them the good they need. Oh, we're not going to hang out for a few minutes if they have questions. Oh, we can hang for a minute or two. I just said. Let's that see what would. comes in. I forgot that you said that. I apologize. It's all right. I wasn't trying to dismiss your offer to support. Thank you for your apology. I appreciate <laughs> that. Did you see how I said it's all right at first? Yeah, I did. I'm still working on that too. Why would you do that? <laughs> yeah, I'm still working on that too. We hope that you all have a good week. Thank you guys for tuning in. Awesome. Sam, always great to see you. Quincy, thanks for joining us. We'll catch you guys on the flippy flop. All right. Looks like we are um, not getting any questions, so we will see you soon or not. Maybe, or maybe next week. Might be arms. a little while. Or I might just. <laughs>